Growing up as the son of Warren Buffett, you might assume that Peter Buffett had life handed to him on a silver platter. But you'd be wrong, as Peter explains in his new book, Life is What You Make It. Peter, thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. Great to be here. So I'm just going to come out of the gate. Great. What was it like growing up with Warren Buffett as your father? That's so weird. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny because as we all got older, people would say specifically, uh, you know, to me, they would say, uh, you know, you're Warren Buffett's son. You're so normal. <laughs> and I thought, well, why wouldn't I be? And it's because of how I grew up. I mean, you know, my dad still famously lives in the house that I grew up in. I go home and visit and I sleep in my bedroom and, you know, the toys aren't there anymore. But uh, I do sleep in my bedroom. There's no fence around the house. He drives himself to work. He's almost 80. He drives himself to work just like he did in 1964 and every year after that. And so, you know, we never saw anything other than a guy that loved what he did and worked hard uh, around the house, you know. And, and so growing up was, in fact, surprisingly normal. And normal is definitely a high praise for sure. Yeah. <laughs> You're an award-winning composer and a musician. Did you ever feel the pressure to follow in dad's footsteps? Well, I will say yes and no. Uh, no in the sense that specifically no. But he always, as well as my mom, they always said, do what you love. Uh, that was critical. And so really, my dad and I do the same thing. We do what we love. And that was where the pressure came in. It's like, don't settle for anything other than your passion if you're lucky enough to find it. I mean, that, that's part of the hard part, you know. Well, and so you have this passion, and typically the life of a musician is not mm -hmm. often lucrative. Right. Um, and so you write that, I've never known anyone to have been hurt by living for a while on cottage cheese and <laughs> apples. Right. Are you telling me that you, <laughs> Mr. Buffett, right. did that? Well, I will tell you that, again, I had the... Uh, pleasure of, of seeing my dad to this day live on not much more than that in terms of ham sandwiches and ice cream for breakfast and things like that. And that helped me a lot because I didn't feel like, you know, I should be special, I should be entitled or anything else. It was about how do I make a living making music? And if, if part of getting there means you know, driving a Volkswagen Rabbit and eating ramen and all that kind of stuff. That's fine with me because I didn't care about that stuff. I just needed fuel <laughs> to do the work I wanted to do. Your folks did help you out. It wasn't as if they said, go out there, you're on your own. So talk about that a little bit, that the, the idea of giving you some money, but not the big money. Right. My dad famously says, enough to do anything, but not enough to do nothing, which is kind of this Yoda-like thing. I, I think like I that. I kind of like that. Uh, and it actually wasn't them. Uh, my grandfather left all the grandchildren a farm. And my dad didn't believe in two things. One, inherited wealth, but the other was the misallocation of capital. So here he had this conundrum because the farm was a misallocation of capital, but if he changed where that money was, it would be more inherited wealth. Luckily, misallocation won out. He sold the farm, got Berkshire stock, and so when I was 19, I got $90,000 of Berkshire stock. And that's through my grandfather, really. And um, so that's what I had to work with. And of course, that's a lot of money in today's dollars. It could be $250,000 or something. So that's a lot of money. But you could go out and buy a house and buy a car and do a couple of you know, pragmatic things with it, and it would be gone. And so my choice was, uh, with my dad's suggestion, really, is to buy time. You know, basically that's more valuable. It certainly was to me. And so that's what I did. I bought time and a little bit of recording equipment. Oh, just a touch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what other lessons can you talk about? I mean, not, I'm sure both of your parents, but we're going to have to invoke your dad because right. he's the famous investor. So right. what, did, what lessons, financial lessons, did you take away from him? Honestly, my dad was not the go-to guy for financial advice. If I had specific questions, he would answer them. But, but you know how safe he is with his investments. If I said, Dad, what should I do with my money? He'd say T-bills. You know, I mean, he right. would be completely safe. So he was not going to dispense a bunch of, you know, little tricks of investment and here's how you can make money fast. That's not what he does. Mm -hmm. so, so really what I learned from him was more about brand building. I learned about how I could build my own brand to, to be more of a instead of a commodity where I'm writing music for commercials. I could be an artist, you know, and get into television and film and records and things like that. So it was, you know, and instead of moving to Hollywood after Dances with Wolves, I stayed in Milwaukee where I was living to kind of follow my own path, much like he did with staying in Omaha as opposed to Wall Street. So it was more of these broader uh, takes on how to 
to build your life your way that I learned from him than specific financial tips. A little over a decade ago, um, your parents gave you and your brother and your sister each $10 million to endow a charitable organization, right? right. And then you each got another billion in 2006 yes, for, the, for the charitable yeah, organization, right. exactly. not you directly. How's that? It feels like a lot of responsibility. It's intense, right? It is intense. The 10 million, because of the 5% rule in terms of how much you have to give away, was manageable. And that grew over time, actually, up until 2006 uh, to a little over 100 million. So that, that we, and my parents were kind of priming the pump to see how we all took to philanthropy. And we all really enjoyed it. And, and it is a huge responsibility. But in 2006, everything changed, for sure. I call it the Big Bang. And uh, my wife and I really had to rethink what we were doing, how we were doing it, and uh, it became a full-time job for sure. In fact, my dad said on the way to the announcement at the New York Public Library, uh, you know, you think this will affect your music. I didn't know what he was talking about. I thought only in the sense that it'll take me away from it is what I would have expected. But in fact, through working through the foundation and going on these trips to Sierra Leone and Bangladesh and learning about these issues, you know, the things we're involved in, I realized that it was affecting me personally, of course, and then that came out in my music. And so my music has taken all these interesting turns because of the foundation work, wow. which I never would have expected. What are the uh, main What are the main goals of your foundation and your siblings? Was they each do something different? Yeah, right? they're all different, and I think that was very smart on my parents' behalf to give us each a, a foundation because that allowed us. Uh, to pursue our own interests instead of potentially fighting over who's most important mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And mine, uh, my, my wife Jennifer really is running it now. For a couple of years we worked uh, together very closely every day of the week trying to figure out how we were going to do it and we came up with essentially focusing on girls and women in a couple of different ways but uh, again it's right out of my dad's playbook. Uh, if you invest in an undervalued asset and you just let it grow and let it do its thing that the market will catch up and recognize its value and you'll get a huge return and to me that's an adolescent girl in the developing world and wow. uh, it's extraordinary really what happens when you invest in girls so that's what we do girls rule they do pretty much and nobody can argue with my fact which is only a girl will be the mother of every child Right? And there it is. There That's it probably is. a good place to end. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much. Absolutely. Great to be here. And thanks for watching.